But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that by believing in him, the Son of God, you may have life according to his name. John 20, verse 31, your fellow redeemed. Important dates we'd like to remember. We hope we remember. We don't always remember important dates in our lives or the lives of people. And so we employ this classic tool, which is called writing them down, so that we would remember it because we want to do that. Typically, most calendars even record some for us. Maybe not so much on the personal level, although it is very personal if you stop to think about it. Christmas and Easter are featured on just about every calendar you look at. They command quite a bit of attention in our culture, and of course that's a good thing. They're viewed as important days. In fact, at one point, it seems, maybe I'm wrong, at one point it seems like Good Friday enjoyed almost equal standing to that of Christmas and Easter. Schools were let out. Places of employment understood if the employee wanted to take off for religious reasons. That doesn't seem to be the case so much anymore. But we can ask the question, well, why, why commemorate these things? Why look back at them? As followers of Jesus, this should be about the easiest thing in the world for you and I to answer. If anyone asks us, why is Easter? Why is Christmas? Why is Good Friday? Let's just keep going. Why is Epiphany? Why is Ascension important to you and I as followers of Jesus? We should be able to say from the fullness of our heart to whoever would ask that, that these are the manifestations of God's plan of salvation that he actually carried through in order to redeem us, human beings, in order to bring us who are lost and astray from him back into his family, back into his kingdom. These events and and these situations that Christ undertook on our behalf are absolutely the most important thing with second place not even existing. There, There really is no second next to that. They stand alone as the most hallowed things in all the universe and all the galaxies beyond galaxies and whatever Star Trek or Star Wars you watch that has these fantastic places all pale in comparison to truth and reality that Christ's salvation for us is of all consuming importance. The fact that the Son of God who is from eternity is one with the Father and one with the Holy Spirit who spoke existence as we know it into being then would step into humanity as one of us. That Christ, the author of the law, would humble himself beneath the very law that he himself wrote and would perfectly obey that law, that that his will, his words and his actions, perfect, righteous, holy, just, and in complete sync with the Father in heaven. This is amazing. He did it. He did it. And then... In love for you and me. That's why he did this. But in love for us, in love for humanity, he's greeted with the ugliness of sin. He's greeted with the, the rebelliousness of sinful man's heart. All the ugly, all the hate, all the horror that could ever be thought about is thrown against him. And he takes it. He takes it. And then in order to pay the penalty that our sins deserve, our sins deserve an eternity outside of God forever. That's what they deserve. There's no negotiation on this one. That's absolute fact. Jesus takes that punishment on the cross where he is forsaken by God the Father for us. He is separated by the Father. Jesus died. The death, we should all die. But he doesn't stay dead, does he? We mark it. We mark this amazing event that God the Father sees the sacrifice of the Son and raises him from the dead raises us from the dead, which becomes in the eternal statement to all that he is satisfied with the propitiation, the payment that Christ gives for our sins. His perfection is now our perfection. We have that through faith, the punishment we deserve he took upon himself for us. And the plan continues, doesn't it? For 40 days, Christ appears In bodily form, not not just some spiritual thing, bodily, glorified. He appears, he talks, he eats, he communes with his disciples, he fellowships with them, 
He talks to one, three, twelve, five hundred at one time. He does this over a period of 40 days. And then, as we observed this morning, we go back to the 40-day marker of his resurrection, which would be Thursday. Christ ascends back to his ruling spot in heaven, back to the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He's in session once again as ruler of all things. Now, it's, it's my prayer that just because this moment in the life of Christ is, is basically not even given much of a passing glimpse in the culture that we live in, that that does not diminish the importance of it. That rather, the Lord would open us up to a greater understanding of God and see what it means that Christ has completely fulfilled what he said he would do in order for us to be saved. Think of it this way. The question of why the ascension is so important. Why is it so important? Well, imagine this. Imagine you built a beautiful house, an incredibly wonderful house, great property, but you never live there. You build it, and there it sits. I mean, that's just ridiculous, right? Who does that? Imagine you cook a meal, a fantastic meal, but nobody ever eats it. It sits on the kitchen table there. Imagine you invent an antidote to a deadly virus, but never use it. It sits locked away in the lab. The ascension takes what Christ has done for us, the birth, death, and resurrection, and it releases it to all of us. And so in that sense, the ascension is the beginning for you and me, for all believers. With that in mind, I invite your attention to the first chapter of the book of Acts. In my former book, Theopolis, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instruction through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, and after, after his suffering he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So far, the very words of our God, in order for us to grow in our faith, God sends us the Holy Spirit to be loose and active in our hearts, bringing his will about in the lives of his people. These words are always a blessing, and the promise of the Spirit is always true and right, so to that end we pray. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and treasure it. Amen. There's so many things that we could talk about, we could just make a list and go through, about what the ascension means to the church of Christ, what the ascension means to the believer, what the ascension does for us. It's fascinating. I hope to explore that just even a little bit this morning. First, I want to leave you with this. The ascension validates every claim that Christ ever made. The ascension validates so many of the claims about the Christ and what he would do and what that means for you and me the believer. In other words, have confidence in Jesus. Have confidence in Jesus when he makes a promise. Have confidence in Jesus when he speaks to you. He speaks with the authority of God Almighty for he is God Almighty. Think of what Jesus did during his, his ministry. But we just went through the Gospel of Mark. Mark is, as you know, the short, packed, fast-moving Gospel. Mark, as you know, relates more miracles per sentence, per verse, per chapter than any other. We saw him cast out demons. We saw him heal the sick. He walks on water. He feeds thousands of people with, with what? Tiny amount of food, a small boy's lunch. He even brings individuals back from dead. 
those miracles all had a purpose. They were a sign like an arrow that pointed to Jesus and announced to the world, this is the Son of God here and now in front of you and me to save and deliver us. Jesus is from God and Jesus is God. The resurrection is, in fact, the greatest miracle of all, that Christ himself is risen from the dead. He proves that he is the Savior. And when he ascends to heaven, it shouts that message to the world to hear. Think of the uniqueness and the miraculousness of Jesus. Continually, he validates the truth that he is the long-ago promised Messiah. And he's impressing it on you and me, his people, his people of all times, Not only is he the Messiah of you and I, which God be praised, we need one. But he's the Messiah of all people, and he wants that to be shared. Matthew, right at the end, Matthew 28, referred to by many as the Great Commission, Matthew closes his gospel account, which really, if we want to be all technical about this, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, as recorded by Matthew, the Holy Spirit, moving him to write. He ends it this way. Jesus is ascending, he says this to his followers, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all things that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always. I mean, that's amazing. He's with us always. He gives us marching orders as his people. Teach not some of the things. Teach not the fun things. Teach all things that I've commanded you. Now take that, take that, and go back into the text and look what's being said by the angels. Right? They, that's the angels, or they, that's the disciples, sorry. They were looking intently in the sky, so they're standing there. Jesus is floating up levitating, miraculous as always, Jesus always doing the miraculous. Uh, Biblical scholars estimate the crowd size close to like 120. That's probably right based on the upper room in Jerusalem at Pentecost, but let's just say a number of people are there. They're watching Jesus go up. They're intently looking into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Who are these people? And what do they say? They say, men of Galilee, Why do you stand here looking up there? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way. You have seen him go into heaven. That's a powerful moment, isn't it? You have the gentle rebuke. But it's not just a rebuke, it's also an encouragement. Disciples, you're not losing Jesus because his physical presence isn't with you. Rather, be filled with excitement that he's returning back, back to the presence of the Father, carrying out his ruling activity over all things. He's God. He does this. He can do this. And know that you've been called into his service. This is great. Not only are you called into his service, he's with you. That's amazing. Jesus is with you. Now, at this point, we can say the disciples haven't quite put that together yet. They will put that together in 10 days at the Pentecost. They will put that together as you watch them conduct this incredible ministry throughout the book of Acts. They will put that together through the working of the Holy Spirit as the Apostle Paul, who was not there at that moment, is moved to write so many epistles. We pray God moves us to put that together, that he is with us as he carries about his ministry through us. The book of Acts... When you look at it, it, it is no mere history report. Like, okay, cool, uh, that's wonderful, look what happened, all right. It is not that at all. The book of Acts is the truth, the truth of Jesus Christ. The truth that everything Jesus did, he did for us, is now 
ours. You see Luke, he's inspired to write uh, to Theopolis. Theopolis is an individual, a uh, Gentile, a Roman individual of some kind of standing. He's referred to as the most excellent Theopolis. Uh, Luke uses the same kind of way of talking about Felix and Festus as well, governors over Judah. And what happens by this point, you know, the Gospel of Luke was also written. Luke goes around, and by the grace of God, he talks to so many eyewitnesses to Christ and the Holy Spirit's working through him, and he's moved to record and to share this, and now he's, he's giving you the rest of the story. And so he's sharing it with Theopolis, but he's sharing it with us. He's showing us and sharing with us the progression of the Holy Spirit working in the hearts and the lives of God's people. Look what happens. The church grows. God grows the church. It's amazing stuff. It's amazing stuff. Now here's something for us to think about. Let's think about the ascension again. But let's not play with words. Too much word play nowadays. Let's, let's be clear and direct. For example, when we talk about ascending, right, if you've ever had the opportunity to go to London, do so. It's a wonderful city. Go to Westminster Abbey. There in that church, you'll see the, uh, I think it's like the, the stone that so many kings and queens and so forth were, uh, what would you call that, coronated on. And if you or I were to see that sitting there in Westminster Abbey, we'd say, ooh, I want to take a seat there. And if you were to ascend to that seat and take a seat, probably some fine individuals would be escorting you out with a lot of questions, so don't do that. But if you were to climb up to that seat, we would just say you are climbing up to sit in the seat, so in that sense you are ascending. But really, I mean, other than getting into some legal trouble, probably not much else is happening. But imagine if you were to actually ascend to the throne. If you were, in fact, to become queen or king of the United Kingdom, we would say you truly have ascended to that position. When it comes to Christ's ascension, he did not float up into heaven because heaven is floating around somewhere in the sky or somewhere in the universe, and Christ has taken a seat next to his father, sort of like the the Greek council of gods or whatever, and he's sitting in his chair, and then now he's looking down at you and I, service dwellers. That is not at all what's going on here. Rather, what happens is Jesus ascends to his rightful position of authority as the one who understands us, as the one who's created us, is the one who became one of us in every which way he lived the human life, dealt with the human issues, all the little indignities that we deal with living in a sinful world. So Jesus dealt with those things, only he did so without sin. He ascends back to the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, pleading our case for us, ruling all things for the good of his people, to the glory of his Father. Now, we have to have that told to us because we wouldn't put that together, right? Certainly, Nature reveals something about God to us. We look around the world, things are orderly, things make sense for the most part. We can see that God must be creative, must be powerful and wise. But we need God to show us himself. We need God to explain characteristics of who he is to us because we don't get it. Because we're blind, deaf, and dumb. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. We need God to come and bring life to us. And that's what he does. Think of the high priestly prayer in John 17 when Jesus says these remarkable words. He says, this is eternal life that they, that they is us, that they is mankind, humanity, whatever you want to call it, that they may know that you, Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life is knowing, believing, and loving God. That opens the door. So don't think that Jesus ascended to a different place. Think of him as recalling his rightful position as ruler of all things. Jesus, the king of heaven, there, and he has defeated death for us. Now again, in in light of the terrible tragedy that happened on Tuesday, and the things that are going on in all of our lives, there's, there's nothing more relevant, more practical for any person than death. How do we deal with it? How do we process death? How do we offer comfort to our loved ones who are having and experienced it or hurt by it? How do we ourselves handle it knowing 
unless God himself would intervene and take us straight to heaven, or God himself would come down again and put an end to these things and usher in the new heavens and the new earth, we are going to have to deal with it and face that. And so Jesus would have you know this, that he has dealt with it. His resurrection announces he has defeated its power. His ascension puts the stamp on it, that it has no power over us. And then his words to us says that he uses death as a transport mechanism to bring his people into his presence for all eternity. And so now Jesus ascended is outside of time, outside of space, yet he's everywhere at once. He's God. He says, I'm with you always. He's with you always, even to the end of age. He's there. He said it. So listen to how the angels talk. This is how the angels now talk to us. They talk to us as if we're standing there. This is what the angels are saying to us. They say, do, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, and in a few days he'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that, that's Jesus telling the disciples. And the angels tell them, go. What did he say to you? Do what he said. Listen to him and follow him. It is not for you to know the times and dates, Jesus says. The Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, Jesus is not going to leave you. He's not going to leave me. He's not going to leave anybody abandoned or alone. He doesn't do that. So he gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. Miraculously and powerfully working through the gospel is the Holy Spirit in the heart of the child of God. I want you to really think about this, okay? We are saturated with self-help books. They're all over the place. You can find anywhere you look, somebody is going to sell you something that is supposedly going to help you. There's no end to motivational stories. There's no end to motivational memes and calendars, and you name it, it's out there. Some of it's fun, some of it's entertaining, and maybe a lot of it's annoying. The gospel is not a motivational speech. This is not some help, self-help stuff. This is Jesus Christ, who did for us what we can't do for ourselves. This is Jesus Christ, who's absolutely perfect, who absolutely honored the Father in heaven with every thought, every word, every deed that he did. This is Jesus Christ, who the innocent suffered for the guilty, for you and for me. This is Jesus Christ talking to us. This is amazing. And he releases the Holy Spirit through the gospel, into the hearts of his people, of his followers. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lord. I am loved, and I am saved in you. And, and by the way, that's the, the, the most terrific comfort you could ever hear. But then you might look at yourself and say, you know what, though? Here's kind of the problem. It's a little bit of a concern that I have. You see, I, I read about Abraham, and he is amazing. And the Apostle Paul made the case that if any man could ever make an argument that he should be justified on his works, it's Abraham, and he's still not. He's still not. But you see, the difference between me and Abraham is whereas Abraham left everything that God commanded him to do, and he followed God to a place he did not know, to a country that was not his, I haven't done that. I haven't even come close to doing that. I survey my life. I evaluate my life. I am not leaving everything I know. I don't think I've been called to. But if I had, I'd be very scared to. And so I'm not like Abraham. Or maybe you're thinking of Joseph. There was a remarkable individual who suffered at an extent so great. He's right up there with Job, and they are, of course, far below Christ. But we look at what, what those men went through, but let's just look at Joseph. Nobody would wish that on anybody they even semi-remotely care about. And yet here he is at the end of all of his suffering looking at his tormentors, which were his brothers, and he says, I forgive you. I acknowledge your sin. It was horrible, believe me. It was horrible. Prison is horrible. Unjustly accused of things is terrible. Being ripped from my, you know, my father, unimaginable. But I forgive you, because God used it for good. Or you think about David who threw down the giant of Goliath, who went on the, the run from Saul. He's the king after him in a land where king is king. And, and these are great heroes of faith. 
great heroes of faith. I mean, have you stared down your giants and said, the Lord will carry me through. I will walk in faithfulness to him. I will not rely on my scheming and my own plotting, my own devices, but on your grace, God. Yeah, okay, we struggle with that. Well, here's the good news for you. I have good news. The Bible's about Jesus. It's not about you and me. Your life, as precious and valuable as it is, it's really not about you either. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. He's the greater Abraham that was perfect in all ways and left his father in heaven to go to a strange land filled with sin in order to save us. It's about Jesus who suffered unimaginable pain and horror and ugliness as a result of our sins and still says, I forgive you and I want you to be with me in my father's kingdom. It's about Jesus who stares down the giant of sin and death and defeats him utterly. It's about Jesus who loves and saves us. It's about the fact that you are loved by this Jesus. You are valued by Jesus. If, if you feel like you're a failure, if you feel like you're, you're not you know, doing what's right in life, or it's not amounting to anything, look to Jesus. Look to the God who loves you, who saves you. Look to the God who's in control of your life and is with you. If, if you're struggling with what you see as unjustly bad things, happening in the world in general or your life in particular go back to jesus know that the lord sees and the lord knows and nothing happens without him and that he does truly work through these awful and difficult and tragic things for his glory and the good of his people which you are won by his grace Look to Jesus and find strength and to carry on. You're going to need it. He's the only one that can give it to you. Trust him with all the suffering, all the injustice that you're going through, that you're experiencing. Trust it into his hands. He will lift you and sustain you. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let the ascension of Jesus bend your focus off of yourself and back to Jesus. Let the ascension of Jesus do this for you to know that he is fixed on us. That we are the object of of his love, and from his throne in heaven, he exercises that love. In his name we pray, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds centered in the one true faith unto life everlasting.